not very sweet. A scrawny, unkempt street fighter, unschooled, and unwilling to do what he didn't want. His voice was only fair. The music that poured out of him defied discipline. But with that music, he rattled the world. Before his brief, vivid life ended, Robert Nesta Marley had taken center stage at the birth and rebirth of a disrespected nation and had stirred a thrilling social cauldron that his songs have kept boiling wherever music reaches. Bob Marley, now on Biography. There had never been anything more misnamed than the great Smile Jamaica concert staged in Kingston, Jamaica in July 1978. Its star performer, the internationally worshipped musician, singer, and songwriter Bob Marley, was performing in excruciating pain. Bullets had been fired into his chest and arm just days before by assassins attempting to kill him and his family in their home. He was there because the powers of the ruling political party had begged him to appear. His daunting job was to keep the lid on a seething Jamaica for Prime Minister Michael Manley. The island had been sliding into anarchy as rival parties in upcoming elections campaigned with guns, beatings and thefts. The thugs who had just days before tried to murder Marley and his family had been extortionists feeding on the chaos. As 80,000 people jammed the National Heroes Circle in Kingston, a brave, aching Marley gritted his way through a tour de force 90-minute performance that rocked the city. The result was a small miracle. In under two hours, Bob Marley had turned an explosive mob into a happy audience, with good cheer spilling out everywhere, even among the politicians. What amazing life had formed Jamaica's first world hero and the amazing music that came out of him. There was a new view of Jamaica and that was the genius of Bob Marley during this period. Something that had to do with just general interpretations of justice, general interpretations of the respect for human rights and the dignity of peoples. And that was, I think, well, just a signal um, aspects of Bob's magic and his incredible ability to really reach out and to personify what society was really thinking about wrestling with. In India, some people I'm sure don't know Elvis Presley, they don't know the Beatles, but Bob Marley's played, Bob Marley's played in Africa, Bob Marley's played uh, in Cambodia, he's played everywhere. And so people look to Jamaica. <laughs> To understand the Jamaica he was born into on February 6th, 1945, is to understand Bob Marley. The beautiful Caribbean island held nothing for descendants of slaves that had been brought to work the sugar plantations. Slavery was gone, but the British colonial rulers remained on top of a teeming underclass. Bob's mixed-race parentage was not unusual, but its mix of classes was. His mother, Sedelia, poor and black, bore Bob out of wedlock to Norval Marley, a white British administrator many years her senior. He married her to legitimize the child before drifting away. Young Bob proved exceptionally bright through a string of public schools, but prone to deep moods and silences. There was much to be moody about. But what Bob always had as he moved about Kingston was music. It was lively and everywhere, and always in a state of transformation by Jamaica's vivid rhythmic touch. There was an indigenous form of music called Mento, which is similar to Calypso. Calypso was also popular from Trinidad. Uh, there was a merengue from Haiti, which was also popular and played in the early sound systems, which were grown in the 50s. So there was huge varieties of music. The business called Sound System was the heart of the Jamaican music industry, such as it was. In a land of few radios and fewer broadcast stations, enterprising disc jockeys would load a set of hefty public address speakers onto a pickup truck and tour the island delivering ear-splitting concerts for an admission fee. For hopeful kid musicians like Marley, it was the only outlet for their music. Clement Seymour Dodd, 
billed as Sir Coxon Downby, was a ruling lord of the business. It was an honor to make a record for him for a few dollars to be played to real audiences across Jamaica. Young Bob Marley would use the serviceable singing voice inherited from his mother to join a ragged army of song sellers. It was a, a music machine. All the artists were employed as day rate laborers. They got no royalties. They came and paid a wage to sing this song. So Bob would sing What's New Pussycat. Bob would sing Amen. Bob would sing uh, This Train. He'd be singing spirituals. He'd be singing English pop songs, American pop songs. He wasn't the world's best singer. He wasn't massively talented at music, but he had a huge passion for it. And he learnt from all those around him. Uh, wherever he went, he absorbed, he practiced, he learnt. Norville Bunny Livingston and Peter McIntosh were two of Bob's earliest friends and slated to become important collaborators for most of his early life. They got themselves heard on talent shows broadcast over Jamaica's two rickety new radio stations. The Sound of Choice was an amalgam of mento and rhythm and blues called ska, a 12-bar blues shuffle with accents on the second and fourth beats, followed by an impish afterbeat. Marley quickly became adept at scrawling lyrics for it on butcher paper. Dodd was by this time cutting his own ragtag records in a studio called Coxon's Music City. Bob and Bunny Livingston paid three pounds for a demo record with two songs, Judge Not and Do You Still Love Me, and sold it to him. Coxon came up with a release form, 20 pounds, and two free acetate records for their own use. Bob would have been even more delighted if he had known anyone who owned a phonograph. But Bob Marley, songwriter and singer, had his first score in the music business. To idolizing fans in the 1970s, the phenomenon that was Bob Marley seemed to have sprung to instant superstardom from nowhere. But a look at that long nowhere would have revealed a grueling journey strewn with both agonies and turns of good fortune. One of those good turns was named Joe Higgs, who came upon a struggling Bob in the early 60s. Higgs was a tough, talented singer and songwriter in the Kingston slum known as Trenchtown. He started a free music clinic attended by Marley, Bunny Livingston, and Peter McIntosh, now known as Tosh. He insisted that they write their own music and perform it in demanding jam sessions. Higgs was especially taken with the haunting readiness of Marley's developing voice and how he drew powerful attention without the other's need to shout and gyrate. The young group named themselves the Wailing Wailers, a nod to their sorrowful backgrounds. He was teaching Bob things about the guitar and Bob was very serious. That's one of the things that came through right through his life. Bob was very serious from the very beginning, very dedicated, as if he had a sense of mission. And he was there struggling with this guitar, um, sitting on the kitchen floor, learning chords and so on, until the wee hours of the morning. He just passed out right there on the floor with the guitar in his hand. Soon, Marley and the fledgling whalers, with an ever-shifting core of backups, were moving nicely up the Trenchtown music food chain. They were solidly into the Coxon Dodd orbit. He became their manager, obtained exclusive rights to release their records, and paid them a stunning $20 for each side recorded. He even gave them an advance to pay for sequined gold lame stage suits. By the time Jamaica gained its independence from Britain in 1962, the Whalers had reached prominence on the island dance scene, Marley had become a local hero, and the neighborhood girls took hard notice. Pretty Rita Anderson, the daughter of a carpenter, was a good musician and an unwed mother. She liked the moodily attractive Bob Marley and put herself steadily in his path. They became good friends and in 1966, man and wife. Bob's remarkable string of children, some 22 of them in and out of his marriage, would punctuate what would be a long and amazingly tolerant union. Soon Marley was beginning to see a somber shift in Jamaica, in both attitude and music. 
The lyrics and mood of the hottest songs had switched from lively sweetness to dark anthems from the Kingston underclass. There was official outrage against this so-called rude boy music. But it was selling fast, and Bob was drawn to it more and more. The Whalers would take it up. Much of the rude boy attitude came from the growing Jamaican attachment to the Rasta movement, a religion peculiar to the island. Rastafarians revered Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, also called Ras Tafari, as a living god who would lead oppressed blacks back to an African homeland. Marley drifted to it slowly but steadily. It was a very powerful religion in that way because it spoke uh, of black people, because in Eth Ethiopian Coptic art, all the stories from the Bible feature black people. Bob eventually joined the Rasta Brethren in regarding marijuana as wisdom weed that had grown on the grave of Solomon and inciting Bible passages that called for unshorn beards and hair. Rasta men embraced scraggly beards and long braids called dreadlocks. Marley came to embrace the look, the weed, the movement, and all its powerful tenets, especially its signature music, something called reggae that Bob would make his own. Uh, the reggae music is a music created by Rasta people, and it carry earth force. The reggae that was influenced by the Rastafarian movement actually had political and cultural components that were teaching us something, that were giving us a sense of identity and history and connectedness and uh, saying something positive about our experience. It was defining us. It was typically a tireless two-chord pattern with throbbing bass, crisp drumming, and double takes on the snare. Everything was unhurried but the beat itself. It sent a message that Bob Marley was ready to take on a long, tough ride to his dreams. In 1967, he tried to spread his wings by signing with J.A.D. Records, an outfit formed by the popular American singer Johnny Nash with entrepreneur Danny Sims. Nash got Bob to tighten up his lazy singing. His leads lost the high-pitched gymnastics and became compelling and plaintive. The Whalers worked steadily, and Bob earned enough to get himself a good car and enough new confidence to give Europe a try with J.A.D. He would find, literally and figuratively, a cold reception. Bob Marley touched down in Europe in 1971 and found the old world a tough new world for him and the Whalers. They found themselves in London for J.A.D. after a deal in Sweden had fallen through. J.A.D. Records were hoping to also launch Bob Marley. Uh, and he came to London, but he only played in very small clubs. Very few people ever went to see him. Lived in you know, uh, cheap parts of London and just hung with the quite large Jamaican immigrant population that was there at the time. Things turned even worse when Bob woke up one morning in London to find that Nash and Sims had gone home without them leaving the whalers stranded and penniless in cold, damp England. The climate tortured Marley. The weather was totally, you know, opposite to what they were used to. And touring in the winter was no fun, I guess. It's, even to this day, it's not really much fun. But especially for them, coming from Jamaican climate where it was always hot and, you know, didn't have to freeze on the way to a gig, <laughs> during the gig and after the gig. A desperate Bob remembered the name of Chris Blackwell, an Anglo-Jamaican entrepreneur who ran Island Records in London and had leased some of the Whalers' records in the past. Luckily, Blackwell was at the moment beginning to feel the power of the Jamaican beat in the UK, in both the clubs and at the cash registers. In Marley's Whalers, he saw a hot Jamaica group who could pump out the new sound for him, especially with some strong new backup Bob had enlisted, including Aston Family Man Barrett, a dynamic musician magical in the recording studio. In Jamaica, in, in the late 60s, is the music bring us together. Bob, hear about my kind of bass playing. You know, hear for a bass man called Family Man. So Bob walk over to me and say, you mean this youth here? You see them called Family Man? 
who play all of those wicked bass lines what I've been hearing. I say yes. So Bob said to me, then if it's really you who play all of those bass lines, you are the right man then. So I am teaching Bob to play the guitar more, teaching him more chords. As him always said in one of his interviews, uh, he could play the guitar much better, but family man won't show him any more chords. <laughs> you know, I tune his guitar. I, I, I am the last man to touch his guitar before we hit the stage every night. Well, anyway, they make a deal, like for a three album deal. So Bob is gonna sing lead and play the rhythm guitar. Bonnie gonna sing harmony. Peter gonna sing harmony and play lead guitar. My brother on drum, Earl Lind on keyboard, and I on bass. So that's the six of us. Bob Marley went back to Jamaica in late 1972 and set about creating what became Catch a Fire. Some of the music was already pre-existing, uh, and some of it sort of recycled in a, a simple manner. This was delivered to Chris Blackwell in early 1973. The album was famously packaged in a, in a cardboard replica of a Zippo lighter. So it was a tactile, interesting object which got it talked about. It also sold handsomely and set the stage for Bob Marley's next attempted advance through the music world's minefields. For all of Marley's heightened profile after the successful release of Catch a Fire, his band met roadblocks both home and abroad. Not the least of their troubles was the wary perception of Marley's Rasta image. Many record producers and much of their public felt that the street violence of the day was already bad enough without thugs in dreadlocks to feed the flames. Uh, Rasta man was always seen as the lowest of the lows. You know, there's stories of where, for instance, at one point, a Rasta man went into um, one of the top hotels in Jamaica and went into the pool, and then they, they immediately drained the pool. Change, once it's being talked about, once it's being broached in any society, generally um, is looked at with great suspicion. And Bob Marley, as he came on the scene, as he attempted to influence the Jamaican reality, was obviously the, the, the full target and focus of that kind of suspicion. But in London, Chris Blackwell still managed to get the Whalers booked into the Tony Speakeasy Club, the epicenter of the British music world. It was an awesome opportunity, and Marley made the most of it. It was a big, big occasion, big event, because it was the first time a black act had played in the Speakeasy Club, because the Speakeasy Club was the bastion of the white rock world. It's where the Rod Stewart's and the Elton John's and all those would go and hang out and, you know, do little impromptu gigs and stuff like that. So I think the record company, um, Island Records, and, which is owned by Chris Blackwell, I think he saw it as a way of them breaking into that circle. And I do remember the nights when they played, I was there, and it was full of all, you know, all the rock fraternity. And they were just completely astounded by, by, by this black man jumping around the stage and, you know, and performing like a rock star. And after that, they, they write up in the paper, say that the first song we play, it casts a spell upon them. And after that, it was like magic. The whiff of success had brought no fabulous rewards as yet, but it was heady stuff too heady for some members of the band. Soon the tight-knit Bob Marley original crew that had stuck together through every reversal would begin to break apart. If the world thought that the Whalers had all along accepted Bob Marley as their leader, they were wrong. Both Bunny Livingston and Peter Tosh were touchy and volatile performers, perpetually flaring up at the notion that Bob or anyone else had ranking above them. Now. With new confidence that they had every bit the voice and personal flair of Bob Marley, if not more, they began to break away. And at the ending of that first year, 72, that's when Bonnie Livingston quit the group. I was surprised. I said, oh, can you get such a, 
a deal, three album deal, and lease your label for 15 years and quit. And at the ending of 73, Peter Touch quit also. So Bob said to me, what are we going to do now? It's only three of us leave. I said, three of us can make it work as the power of the Trinity, <laughs> you know. Since the Whalers' beginning, any designation of leadership had been left out of the band's name. But with the departure of Bunny and Tosh, the obvious was stated in the new handle, Bob Marley and the Whalers. Well, he became a fabulous songwriter, and it was his medium for communicating. So though he wasn't musically talented in the way that many people think of as a musician like Stevie Winwood or Stevie Wonder, uh, he had an enormous desire to communicate with people about his experience and his beliefs. And suddenly, the Marley band that had been striving for meaningful work for all its existence found itself beginning to be buried in worldwide demand for their increasingly obvious talents. We are working on that album called Natty Dread. A lady came down from Woodstock called Martha Valley. So she's doing an album called Escape Out of Babylon. And we are to produce the album for her. So we stop our project and record the album for her, overdub, mix it, so she could get it to go back to the USA. So we back in the studio to finish our album now, Natty Dread. Out of the blue, we get another invitation come from San Francisco. This was Taj Mahal. He's working on a album called More Roots and said he hear of us and he like our sound and he want to, to, to make a cover version of one of our songs called Slave Driver. And he want us to come up to San Francisco and Berkeley to produce it for him. So we went away again. <laughs> and again and again. And everywhere Bob Marley went, the seeds of the Jamaica sound were planted. There was a big scene in LA at the time about the new concept of music. And when everyone gets to find out what the new concept is, it's the drum and the bass. So from that, you know, American music began to mix now with that heavy drum and the bass, you know, to catch the Jamaica dub style. <laughs> But it didn't translate into American dollars. Marley brooded endlessly that he was not able to capture the artistic or commercial fancy of the American public. He could never crack America. Black Americans never liked him during that period because black America had their, had, had, had their revolution in the 60s and they'd now been up, gone up the hill. So for them, it was like, well, oh, man, you know, it's all this, <laughs> you know, they, they didn't want anything to do with him, really. It was very hard for him at that point. We did not hear Bob Marley. He wasn't played on our radio stations. Um, he was not visible to us when he first began to come to America. It took time for it, the, I, the message to get through of what this reggae was, what this Rasta was, what this Bob Marley was saying. At that time, we were so miseducated as a people about who we were and what we were about that something from Jamaica or any of the other islands or directly from Africa was considered foreign. I'm really keen that people develop their view of Bob Marley and realize that, you know, he was at it for a lot of years and global fame only came when he was about 30. And he didn't actually have many years of global fame. So it would have to be England and Jamaica that provided the rest of Bob Marley and the Whalers' growth. Growth which always seemed slower and more erratic than Bob's huge talents demanded. He would have to turn up the heat, and this time he would have troubled times on his side. If Bob Marley's ominous Rasta image had once been a drag on the Whalers' success, in the riotous events of London in the middle 70s, it would help catapult him to stardom. In Britain in the, uh, the mid-1970s, there had been riots at Notting Hill. Uh, the black community, particularly the Jamaican community, that at one time had been quite quiet and, I suppose, you know, well-behaved. There was a new generation coming through. Uh, who were not going to put up with the notices that could be seen in London of no blacks, no, no Irish, no dogs. Uh, 
and they came out fighting. A lot of British wealth had, was, uh, was off the back of slavery. So there was, there was big movements happening in British society as well, which is undoubtedly uh, something that helped Bob's popularity. But there was a radical view of change and that change needed to happen on a global scale. In this tinderbox atmosphere, Marley was booked into the Lyceum Theatre for a concert in which he would loose all the demons of his Rasta music and lyrics with no regard to past niceties. The place was absolutely packed out, jam-packed. And I'll tell you, it was so packed, it was actually raining inside. The steam, the heat from the people rose up to the, to the ceiling of the building and then came down as droplets of rain. It was an incredible sight. There was even people climbing somehow on top of the roof, trying to get in, because everybody wanted to see the mighty, the one and only, the great Bob Marley. When they came out, they knew they had seen and heard the beginning of the new order. It became one of those concerts that everybody wanted to have been at, everybody claimed to have been at, uh, and the album, uh, a live album which was released very shortly afterwards, really started to notch up some sales which were considerably more than had been achieved previously. Bob Marley now had to find a way to deal with something that had not been much of a problem before, success. Bob Marley turned from his successes in Europe to his first love, Jamaica, and for the first time he felt he had begun to move into a position to do something for his beautiful but blighted home. Bob clearly always uh, had had roots in Jamaica and Jamaica was an important place to him uh, and he went back and wanted to try and become uh, help with what was happening in that country. Bob gave that vibe of anything was possible. And suddenly in Jamaica, you had all these kids from uptown, as they call it, you know, starting growing locks. You see, before Bob Marley came along, it was the most taboo things you could do. But suddenly you see Bob Marley had a house next door to the Jamaica, to the Prime Minister. So it's okay, yeah, you know, go grow your locks. You know what I'm saying? He had a BMW. You know, one of the first men to have a BMW in Jamaica, you know, it's like, so everybody wanted to have a BMW. But apparently BMW hated it, the fact that, because he, they said it cheapened their cars. Real money began to roll in for Bob Marley for the first time, and he didn't quite know what to make of it. He had uh, bought Chris Blackwell's old house at Hope Road, which was a colonial, you know, the up uptown colonial part so here was a raster man now living in the uptown part of Kingston uh, and it was the center for uh, a lot of rasters and you know a vibe was happening around there Bob Marley had no interest in turning his big new house into some rich man's fortress it was to represent roots that he had never had it welcomed not only his immediate family but all his sprawling new retinue business associates, beautiful models, celebrity hangers-on, any of his Rasta brothers who could find room to sprawl around the grounds. But he never neglected his work or stopped respecting his closest associates. Between us, it was just the whalers, you know. It was a team effort. It was like a real band, you know. Everybody did what everybody else did. We all played soccer, we all ate together, we traveled together. Um, to the press and maybe the promotion people, it was Bob and the Whalers. As far as he was concerned, he was just a whaler, another, you know, part of the chemistry. And I think everyone was equally important in making that, you know, combination of lyrics and music that had that deep foundation and could, you know, um, be rewarding to so many people. When we in our musical room, discussing, you know, jamming, grooving, getting our heavens together with our spiritual vibes, with a little burn, offering and things like that, you know. <laughs> That's how we come up with these strange kind of sound and concept of lyrics, and we put music to it. Bob would basically maybe have the structure of the song, but not completed. And we would, you know, go in there with our ideas, rehearse, change a few things, come back, rehearse some more, then actually 
finish up in the studio, and sometimes he'd say, I don't remember writing this song. <laughs> That's not how he started out, you know, but I like it. <laughs> Our plan was, was to turn Tough Gang into a little Motown, was to take up all of these other artists off the street who, who've been mistreated over the years and bring them into Tough Gang and get other bands to and had a hacks. It is said that half of Jamaica was existing off of his generosity. Half of Jamaica. And the half of Jamaica we're talking about, the ghetto half of Jamaica. Bob wasn't the kind of person who sat down and wrote a contract and he was more into the brotherly love. You know, we're a brethren, we stick together, we, we trust each other. And um, that was more that type of philosophy, you know, with Rastafarianism and godliness and things that he tried to believe in. He tried to practice also. Money meant absolutely zero to him. What he did do with the money, which I knew from the, one of the first times I worked with him on the first tour, he would always, on day offs, he'd always go to sports shops and he would buy like 24 pairs of football boots. 24 football, 24 strips, tons of stuff. And he'd be going back to Jamaica to Trenchtown for the kids. That's what the, the, money, the wealth meant for him. But if Bob was living mellow, he wasn't writing mellow. His 1974 album, Burnin', was loaded with howling black power songs like I Shot the Sheriff, Burnin' and Luton, and the sizzling Get Up, Stand Up. While the police saw a murder cult forming and were more ready than ever to level a Rasta with a nightstick, the whole world was snapping to attention, even the United States. A scrawny Rastafarian was becoming the best-known figure in the third world, and Jamaica's leaders were far from happy. Increasingly, the Rasta men began to get into politics, and they were not much for talking and voting when there was a weapon or fist to make their point. The roughshod political parties played them against one another. Things began to get tense, and Marley tried to keep out of it. I think he, he realised quite early on that the best thing was to stay away from politics. Politics in Jamaica was, and, and still is, a violent and very dangerous business. But now the cover of his new release, Uprising, showed a Rastaman on the cover, fist raised, dreadlocks brushing his shoulders like an urban revolutionary. If that wasn't a political statement, what was? The Hope Roadhouse now held a faster, meaner crowd. Bob didn't know how to screen out the hangers-on. His old friends felt he thought he was outgrowing them. And he now insisted on first pick of the beauties that hung about. Rita's silence about his straying was expected and quietly granted. Bob's ascendance was given final affirmation when the idolized Stevie Wonder agreed to come to Jamaica to appear in concert with the Rastaman upstart and when the hit Whaler's Rastaman Vibration album was released a few months later, Marley had surpassed Wonder as the top musical superstar in the third world. At this moment, when the whole world was opening up to him, he nicked a toe on a rusty nail in a pickup soccer game. The wound was slow to heal, but a doctor-shy Marley chose to let it go. It would prove a fatal mistake. What passed for an election campaign in Bob Marley's Jamaica in 1976 was little more than a confrontation of vicious gunmen demanding allegiance, power, and money. Bob Marley was not spared. Strong-armed men from one of the political parties barged into his house. They called him a dread capitalist and pressured him to appear at a wryly named Smile Jamaica concert, arranged to distract an angry people from what was happening to their government. That wasn't all of Bob's trouble. He had been giving dangerous extortionists $2,000 to settle a trumped-up debt, and now they were murderously angry his concert activities had interfered with the payments. Days later, armed gunmen slipped through into the Marley home and set out to kill all inside. Bob was hit in the chest and arm, Rita in the head. Assistant Don Taylor was critically injured by five bullets. The children and others escaped in a rain of gunfire. 
Whether from outside pressure or from courageous indignation, Bob Marley, bandaged and in pain, appeared at the Smile Jamaica Festival, allowing no part of his torment to show. Inside, he wasn't doing it for the politicians. He was doing it for Jamaica. Immediately afterward, Marley left the dangers of Jamaica to begin the hectic few years that would cement his international legacy and help bring his long overlooked country and its special music to the first rank of world respect. He was looking for a guitarist because when they had the shooting in Jamaica at the end of 76, he had a guitar player, I think, an American by the name of Donald Kingsley. And after the shooting, he must have got totally freaked out and left the band. And they had another guitar player, Al Anderson, before him, who I believe was working with Peter Tosh. So Bob was looking for a guitar player who could play as well as Clapton or anybody else like that, you know. And he was quite happy when he discovered that I could play different styles, ranging from Hendrix to George Benson, you know, to T-Bone Walker. Not only did I have a reggae background, but I had a kind of rock and roll background as well. And I was able to make everything kind of fit rather than stick out like a sore thumb, you know. So he was quite happy that he could get that influence in reggae and people liked it. 1977, it was a big year for Bob. It was the first year that he really got chart success as we would know it now, with top 10 hits. Exodus was a big hit. He was becoming far more mainstream, uh, one of the big acts that anybody would see, uh, which was a huge journey for, a, for a, you know, a boy from the third world. I joined at the time when it had taken off, you know, because uh, Rastaman Vibration had made it into the American top 10 and uh, Catch a Fire and Burning did pretty well also. And uh, I think Exodus was my favorite and still a favorite of many people. So I came in at a really good point where they were, you know, they had the budget, they had the studio, they had the team behind them, you know, they had a good record company, good tours. <laughs> it was like non-stop, you know, we were together 24-7, touring around the world, going to Japan, Australia, Europe, United States. It was very exciting. It was a lot of work, but it was very exciting. And um, being in a band that creating a, a new form of modern day music made it even more exciting. He had become not just an engine of change in the colonial world, but its symbolic statesman. Where there was third world crisis or unrest, Bob Marley showed up and gave himself to make things better. He appeared in Zimbabwe at the ceremonies handing the country back to its people after hard years of colonial rule. The, the ruler of uh, Zimbabwe, the white ruler, had said that never in a thousand years would things ever change in Zimbabwe. And almost in a thousand days, it did. I swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Zimbabwe and observe the laws of Zimbabwe. So help me God. This was perhaps the crowning moment of his life, to be invited to Africa, the only performer from outside of Zimbabwe to come and to perform and to be the feature performer. This is what his songs were all about. He saw himself as a freedom fighter. And, you know, in my opinion, Bob was a freedom fighter. What made these last performances even more remarkable was that Bob Marley knew he was a dying man. The innocuous toe injury, not properly treated, had turned into a cancer that had spread through his body. It was very sad for us because we were just, you know, kind of like taking off. And everyone was very um, into what we were doing. Everyone was very excited. Everyone was very focused and Bob was creating a lot of really good material with the help of the band. And uh, you just, everything was just going for us. You couldn't foresee that happening and nobody dreamed that it would ha happen that way, you know, so it was like a shock treatment when we found out that he had like a tumor in his brain and he wouldn't be touring much longer and, you know, what might be called the end. <laughs> 
He was basically on his way to uh, Switzerland for the treatment. And what I remember was really sad was we both sat down together in the, in the, in the apartment and we spoke. But he never spoke in the same positive way that we normally spoke when we spoke to each other. And then eventually he got up and went to a room and came back with all these um, gold disc and platinum discs and was showing it to me. And I kind of felt somewhere along the line, it was like he was kind of saying to me, do you think it was really worth it, Dennis? You know, I think somewhere along the line, he wasn't quite sure what it was all about. And then he sat down and he started strumming his guitar and he played his song, which I never knew what it was at the time. But eventually I found out when he died, he was actually playing Redemption song. And maybe I got a first hearing of it, who knows? Long live Bob Marley. The doctor came in one day and Bob said to the doctor, tell me the truth, doctor. I want you to tell me the living truth. Am I am going to make it? And the doctor looked at him and said, no, you're not going to make it, you know, Bob. And him said, Bob even asked him and said, how many more days I have to live? And the doctor must have told him like three or four days. And him said, Bob just started to tell him about it. Pack up everything, I'm going back to Jamaica. He stubbornly fought the disease for months longer than anyone thought possible. But finally, on May 11th, 1981, Bob Marley died. He was just 36 years old. He was taken back to Jamaica and mourned at a gigantic state funeral and addressed with all the honors he had so solidly earned. His message was a protest against injustice, a comfort to the oppressed, a search for peace, and a cry for hope. Sadly, Bob Marley's passing left not just inspiration and grief, but a special sadness for the men who had helped him shape his music and had been with him in his last hours. The Marley family had formed a protective ring around the dying man that had shut them out. Like his family and had of people who were around him there, they didn't want Carlton Barrett or family man Barrett to be there because after a while I get to understand that all the people who was up there, they all went up there to get money. Bob would have long his head like this in tears. He was crying to see me and they don't want me to get close. In this day and age, you have to be legally, you know, accounted for. <laughs> But we were too busy, like, having a good time and playing the music and thinking that everything was going to be great. Not even one thinks like Bob. So we had to live with that afterwards. So here we are still celebrating the music of Bob Marley and the Whalers and trying to, you know, keep going on. Though Bob Marley left the world too soon a quarter century ago, his exuberant heartbeat goes on heard every day by millions in the hypnotic rhythms of the reggae anthems that have made him immortal.